Uh, we didn't have a quiz. Uh, maybe I'll give you one today. Um, theorem seven is what we were using pretty heavily. And again, the integration by parts is designed for those cases when you cannot find the right substitution to take antiderivative. Well, in fact, sometimes uh, you can replace the substitutional method using integration by parts and vice versa. So the message is there is, I guess, no unique way to find the antiderivatives. So I guess pretty much all we have here is just examples. So I will be doing some problems today to recall the process. So for example, exercise number 12, how can I work out such a problem? Well, when I see x cube under the ln sign, then I wonder if I could just replace that x cube with a new variable because its derivative will, will be x squared, actually two times x squared, right? And then dx will give us du. So we can rewrite our integrand with ln of u on the first position. And then we have x squared multiplied by dx, and that's what we have here as well, but no two. So that's why we usually put two in denominator, right? So the other piece will be du over two, because if you cancel this twos, then you get exactly x squared dx. And then I have to use parts. So this exercise is not that pleasant because now I need to replace ln of u with, well, I guess u is not a very good choice because we usually replace with u and then dv, right? So maybe I could try some other letter rather than u because if I utilize it again, it may not be very convenient. So what other letter we know instead of letter u? Let's say v, well, u and v are taken. I can try z, for example. So if I have it called as a z, so I just put z everywhere, ln z and then dz. And then I replace the ln z with u, right? Because now we have that setting where we have u and dv. I say, what about this over two? Should you put it on the outside or with uh, u or where? It doesn't matter. So wherever you like, you can put it. I just don't want to rewrite anything, so that's why I just keep it the way it is. dz over 2 is equal to dv. Just to show you that the constants make absolutely no difference to us. They could be just about anywhere. So when you take derivative of ln, it's going to be 1 over z with dz, which is same as du. And uh, for the other piece, I take antiderivative, right? Because we need to pull out what V is. And that's going to be one half of Z or Z over two. So here comes parts. So now I know that I have to set it as U times V minus integral V times D. So we now going to use all of these 
pieces, Ln Z instead of U, instead of V is a Z over two, then we put a minus sign, integrate V, which is again Z over two, and then DU. See those pieces, they just uh, being set up all together, just way they are little by little. But then your concern will be in this portion and taking the antiderivative of this number one half, right? And well, it's just gonna be that same constant, but with a variable z next to it. So we get a ln z times z over two and minus. So we integrate just one half, right? One half, so one half stays. And then we have the z plus the constant. And once I have that, then we already have the answer, but need to go back where we started with the original variable letter X. So here's the replacement back Z with X cube. So I'll put X cube everywhere where I used to have Z. And that makes the exercise uh, longer as it's a two-step process, we first did the substitution, and second, we did parts. I say, could you do parts right away? You could try and see if that would work. It may work or may not, because if you put this part as a U, then you could take the derivative of that, and it may work without actually doing the substitution. So. Problems may have various ways of solving. And uh, sometimes you might use a different substitution. Sometimes you might start exercise completely different and the result may not look the same, but because there is a plus a constant at the end, all of your possible answers will differ by that constant because technically this is infinite set of problem uh, of solutions because constant could be zero or if it's one it's very different or if it's one over two or whatever number you add at the end the result is not exactly the same function so i was planning to introduce you with this and I guess maybe a little later today, I'll return back to this and we'll see some more. Because right now I want to move on to the very last section that we supposed to take a look at. And this very last section will be a section 5.3. It's in the next chapter 5.3, which is very, interesting type of integration that deals with infinitely long limits. So the areas will extend to infinities. So let's take a look at their examples in here. So for instance, if we are going to consider area under the function, one over x squared. Notice this extends infinitely, it goes forever to the right. But when someone is trying to find this integral, then to make our fundamental theorem of calculus work, they turn the integral into the limit. So they can integrate from one to some particular number b. They like to use letter b here, that function one over x dx, because they will be able to replace 
upper limit with finite number B and then lower limit with one. And then they will send this letter B to infinity. And that's how they will get this infinite integral because we can do the limits when something approaches to infinity. We used to find those limits already. But for the antiderivative part, we must have a finite number on the top. So if I integrate, like in this example, one over x squared, so write what they have here, one over x squared, then I can integrate that one over x squared using the old favorite power rule for the antiderivatives. I will write it as a power of negative two of x, right? And then we'll add one to this power. So x will be raised to the power of minus two plus one, right? So it's negative one. And I put that same negative one in denominator. And also I can write this as one over x plus the constant. So I actually, I actually found the antiderivative of this, but the limit is what I'm gonna find on the next step. So I replace this integral with a one with a negative sign, one over x that varies from one to b. And then I will apply that fundamental theorem of calculus, so-called, I will, plug in B and then plug in one and subtract the results and see what's gonna happen when I take a limit. So negative one, one, like that. So notice that the second piece will just turn into plus one. This whole structure means plus one, right? One over one is one, two minuses is plus. But when I look at the limit, when B approaches to infinity, so B becomes very, very big. And one over B then will turn into zero because it's one over big. Remember, idea one over big is small. And small is zero. You see that's negative sign here. Well, negative is still zero. Minus was a zero, plus was zero. It's still a zero. So I end up with zero plus one. And we just found that infinite area from one to infinity ends up being something like a number one. And that looks like what they also did in here. So this is amazing fact, right? You have area that extends all the way to the right, and it is not infinite. It's finite. And that's just very interesting fact. Of course, there are all kinds of uh, possibilities. Sometimes it is infinite. Sometimes it is finite, but the key idea was just considered in here. We turned this infinite limit into the finite. And that's what we practice doing in this section. And that's why I wanted to really introduce you with this section because it's very popular procedure in calculus when you deal with the limit, which is infinity. So I can try another exercise here. How about problem number nine? Now we have to take a look at integral of uh, dx divided by two plus x. So 
it looks like I need to use a substitution. Some people might guess right away, so it's just going to be a ln of 2 plus x. But to be formal, I can replace 2 plus x with new variable, let's say letter u. And then derivative of x is going to be 1, so it's dx is equal to du. Uh, I don't pay attention right now to the limits. I will take care of them on the next step. So it's going to end up being du that replaces my dx, the numerator, right, same. And then denominator is u. So we get ln. And people say absolute value of u, but since we have the limits from zero to infinity, it's all positive. So you just don't have to worry about that absolute value because logarithm is defined only for positive numbers. So anyways, what about the actual number nine? How can I calculate that? Well, since my upper limit is infinity, automatically I'm going to write it with a B, I really like letter B for this integrals that called improper. It's a special name because one limit is infinity, it's an improper integral. Well, two limits may also go to infinity, still be improper. So we started at zero and ended at B. So that's the key part. So we have finite limit. And now I can just utilize the result. So we are integrating this, let me write it, okay, dx over 2 plus x. And then we actually did all work in the gradient and we got ln of u, right? So I can, don't forget, write it as limit b to infinity. And we have ln of uh, not u, but Two plus x. And I don't put the constant because we have upper and lower limits to replace. So let's see what's going to happen. And it looks like nothing good is going to happen because we're going to take the limit of logarithm of infinity because two plus b for the first piece, right? B I put instead of x. And then I put zero, so I subtract ln of two plus zero, so just two. And even though that second piece is finite, but that one is going to infinity. The reason is the b is approaching to infinity. The only cases when those disappear is when we have a fraction, like in the previous example, when b is in denominator, so you get one over big, which is small. Then we have it finite. But since b is not in denominator, but inside the logarithm, then it is infinity. So we say that integral is divergent. There is a special word for a diversion. I say, so can I say it's just infinity? Yeah, it's fine. But they like to use word diversion because in the future they want to utilize this for something that is divergent. That's why they want you to hear that word. But anyways, that's nice to know. And you can just say this is infinity because the limit is infinity. So let's try another one in here. And these are all, I think, of pretty much the same nature. So let me do problem like number with ln for a change. So we can utilize our knowledge of integrating by parts. How about that? So if I have ln of x, dx. Again, I'm not trying to pull all this structure with me with limits, infinity, it's going to take a while. I just want to 
write this as a antiderivative first, and we have to go u d v for that case. Remember, you have no choice but do the parts. So when I call ln as a u and dx as dv, then as usual, we integrate second and differentiate the first one. So we take derivative of ln as one over x with dx, which has did that type of exercises, is equal to du. And from the second, just x, dx is equal to dv. I should be a little bit more careful. Right? dv. So we've got that x equal to v, and then we can go with the formula, remember it, uv minus integral of v d. So I put everything I have now in that. So it seemed to be pretty nice and short integrand, but it's uh, actually requiring us to do a little bit of work. So we got u, which is ln of x times v, which is letter x minus integral of v, which is another x times du, which is this one over x dx. But the good thing is that we can take care of this integral right now, because with a land we can't. So we get this x is canceled. And then we're going to integrate only number one. So I can put x in front of ln of x. That's how people usually do this, because they commute anyways. And then we have minus x and plus the constant. <laughs> and then this is what I'm going to utilize to do problem number 18 that I will be preparing as a limit when B goes to infinity, right? B goes to infinity. And then we have that integral from one, actually, yeah, from one to B of this ln of x dx. And the integral of ln of x dx, I just worked out above so I can write what it was equal to x times ln of x minus x and plus the constant I will not write because we have a definite integral as usual. So we have to this we have this limit b to goes to infinity. And uh, then I'm going to need to use those 1 and b and see what's going to happen, right? So <clears throat> now I have to plug b in it. So this is going to be still a limit to look at. And when we are dealing with b times ln of b as one piece minus b. And then we also going to take a look at the other one when we plug one in. So it'll be one ln one minus one, you have to subtract all that. See, it gets a little tedious. So now there are too many b's here. Maybe I can factor b out. So I get a b times ln of b minus one for purpose of taking the limit. So I have a limit when b goes to infinity here. I just factored out B. And the other piece is going to be just fine because remember what ln1 was? Zero, right? So this is equal to zero. 
And then we have just negative one left, so it's just minus one. Now, remember that ln b goes to infinity because we just used it in the previous example as well. B itself also goes to infinity. So I'm multiplying big number by another big number. And as a result, I get a big number, I get an infinity. Or people say divergent limit. And I say, well, Alex, there is plus one here also. Well, this plus one makes no difference because you still have infinity increased by one. Well, nothing's going to happen. It's still infinity. So this type of exercise is a little bit time consuming, right? A little bit time consuming. But I guess you could still do this. And the key part is to be able to work out that special improper integral by using the limit. And that's pretty straightforward. I just looked at the exercises and uh, thought that maybe what I can do is problem like number 14, and then I will ask you to do number 13 for practice, because number 13 is pretty much same as number 14. I think it's even nicer. Let me do number 14 for you right now. So we are working with the uh, integral that I could take of e to the power of 2x. But since the upper limit is infinity, then I'm going to put a b in it, right? So I go integral from 0 to b and e to the power of 2x dx. So we're going to integrate e to the power of 2x dx, and it's going to be e to the power of 2x over 2 we can guess this answer because if I differentiate this, then I should get back e to the x. So if I take derivative of e to the power of 2x, then it'd be the same e to the power of 2x, but 2 will be in front. And that's why I need to have 2 in denominator, remember, to cancel. So we have this limit that's still patiently waiting to be taken, and we supposed to place the zero and B, so we got the answer. So it looks like now I just plug those two in, and looks like the B is going to give us something that will tell us that divergent or infinity for the result, right? Let's say you got e to the power of two times zero here over two and e to the power of zero is one. So we actually get one half, but the first piece e to the power of big is gonna be big. So it's really the infinity. And that's why people say the word divergent, that's a new word for the integral, which means it's actually infinite in this case. So how about if you do for quiz for today, exercise number 13? And uh, I think it'd be pretty much same thing as number 14. And you can just put the answer divergent or Convergent, that's opposite to divergent, either convergent or divergent. And that'd be our little quiz for today.